Well, an engine fire forced a plane flying out of LAX to turn back and make an emergency landing today. We want to show you new video from LA Flights Alive showing the engine trouble on Delta Flight 446. Nothing will get your attention faster than flames coming out of your left engine. And Delta 446 is taking off out of LAX. And shortly after rotate, they get an engine fire. These guys are the pilots I want to have on my next flight. They handled everything right by the book. Let's talk to the pilots. Delta 446 heading contact SoCal. Departure. Delta 446 heading contact. Everything's normal right now. Okay, Delta 446 Heavy is uh, checking in with you. Uh, 1,500. We have a fire burns. We have an indication of a engine fire. Okay, so the first thing you hear from them now, passing through 1,500 feet, they've got an indication of an engine fire. Why do they put it that way? They're, it's not verified. They don't know if it's an indicating problem or there's actually a flame. We know from the video that we looked at that it's actually a flame. So they're going to treat it like it's the real deal. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through step by step exactly how we're trained and exactly what these pilots did in the cockpit. It's really fascinating. Let's listen in. Uh, Delta 446, heavy took out departure, radar contact. Roger, do you just want to level up at a lower altitude? Yes, sir. Delta 446 Heavy, Roger, just uh, maintain whatever altitude you need, and uh, I want the equipment to be standing by, correct? Correct. Well, 2,000 good? All right, where's Delta 446? 3,000, okay. We'll go to 3,000 Delta 446 Heavy. Delta 446 Heavy, yeah, whatever we need, 2,000 or 3,000, okay? 3,000, right. Okay, so 2,000, 3,000, you know, he's saying basically whatever altitude you want. Almost every time that I go to training, we go to 3,000 feet. I don't know why. It's just an, an altitude that we pick that uh, will most likely keep you above any sort of terrain. There is a, a, uh, a sector off the end of almost every major runway that looks like a cone. It, it widens as it goes out farther. It goes out to about 25 miles where you've got clearance, usually at two or 3,000 feet to stay above any sort of obstacle so that if you have an engine failure, you can just climb straight out. Now, obviously these guys are out over the ocean. There's no obstacles in front of them. They're gonna revert right to their training. They're gonna go runway heading to 3,000 feet. And then uh, after the pilot flying says, my aircraft, he's gonna direct the pilot monitoring to grab the quick reference checklist and do the first five items on that checklist. There may be 25 items total on the engine fire checklist. They're only going to do the first five. Why? They want to get the engine contained. They then next want to get the airplane cleaned up, meaning the flaps retracted, and then they want to get back, headed back towards the airport. And I'll walk you through all of that. I told the 446 have you are you ready to return at this time? We, we can make a turn back toward the field uh, to set up for a uh, ILS to either runway. Okay, so he says we're ready to return back to the field and set up. So what has taken place in that cockpit in the intervening time? Now, this whole episode probably took them 15 to 20 minutes. We've got six and a half minutes worth of video to react to here because we compressed it a little bit for you. But basically this, uh, depending on where the engine failure or fire is, if it's right after rotate, let's say they're at 200 feet, there's what's called an engine out altitude. And that altitude is set differently for every airplane on every takeoff. It depends on the elevation of the field the capabilities of that aircraft. Typically speaking, it's about 800 feet to 1,000 feet above that field level. And we will we will dial that in to our instrument right in front of us. So if I lose an, an, an engine on takeoff, I'm going to say to the other pilot, my aircraft, and I'm simply going to hold what I've got. I'm going to ask them to raise the gear to get rid of the drag, and we're just going to climb out. We're not going to do anything until we get to 400 feet. At 400 feet, I'm going to say quick reference checklist. Let's do the first five items. Then we're going to confirm everything that we do. It's the challenge response response checklist. The pilot monitoring gives me the challenge. I respond, he responds, and then we do the action, right? That's the same with the, the, the auto throttle switches with the thrust levers or the throttles as you would think of them, they get pulled to idle. Those fuel control switches that have been in the news so much recently, they get grasped by one pilot, the other pilot confirms it, and they don't get placed to cut off until the both pilots agree that they have the proper engine and then they go and shut it off. Why? They don't want to shut off the wrong engine and have both engines now not working for them. So the first five items get taken care of and then you 
clean up the aircraft. Now, these guys were already at 1,500 feet, so they would have most likely have started the cleanup process. Maybe they were in the middle of it. Maybe they were taking off with flaps five. They got to bring them up to flaps one and then flaps up. Uh, that takes, a you know, 30 seconds to a minute to do all that. Once they get completely clean, it's now called con, con, con. What is that? All right. Once they get completely cleaned up uh, and they've gone through those first five items on the checklist, the engine knows to go to continuous power. And you'll see that on your screen. It'll just say CON for continuous power. It's a power setting somewhat less than climb power, but somewhere above normal cruise. It gives you enough power on one engine to fly that airplane safely to come back and to land. So once the computer sets continuous power, and if it doesn't for some reason, there's a button I can hit, it's called the con button, where I can get that to go to continuous power. Once I see continuous power, I think to myself, con, con, con. I've got continuous power. I can now continue, C-O-N, continue with the checklist, and I continue, continue back for a landing. So I do all three of those things at that point. These guys are at that point when they say, yeah, we're ready to turn back. Uh, Delta 446 Heavy Rogers, uh, clear to Los Angeles Airport via radar vectors. Turn left, heading up 090 and maintain 3000. 090, 3000 at the 446. And we'll be right back to this, but first, a word from our sponsor. One of the things we take very seriously on this channel is accuracy, especially when we're covering a developing situation like the Air India 171 crash. There's a flood of headlines when something like this happens. But if you followed our breakdowns, you know we go deeper than the headlines. We want to know what's really happening on the ground. What are people in the region seeing? What are their local outlets reporting? Not just what's echoing across social media or U.S. news. And that's where ground news comes in. Ground News gathers news from over 50,000 sources around the world and helps us compare how a story is being covered, not just across the political spectrum, but across geography. When we covered Air India 171, Ground News helped us to cut through the noise and get local perspectives, actual reporting coming out of Mumbai, New Delhi, and the aviation community in India. That gave us details and angles you won't find in Western coverage. Here's a story I've been following with roughly 50 sources reporting on the preliminary report and investigation into the crash. 62% is coming from the sources on the right compared to 24% on the left. And with their helpful map, we can see that the majority of coverage is from India. Ground news is easy to use. It gives you tools to spot bias, see blind spots in your media diet, and compare how the same story is being reported around the world. So if you care about getting a clearer picture, not just the loudest one, go to ground.news slash Captain Steve for 40% off the Vantage plan. Scan the QR code or visit the link in the description below. Because we're not just reacting to the news, we're researching it. Ground News helps us do that better. And a very special thanks to Ground News for sponsoring today's video. Sponsors like this help us to make more content for you. 3000 is always Delta a good one, four, six, heavy end. Is, uh, is the engine fire contained yet or is it still on? Uh, we're, check, we're working on it. Okay, so what does he mean they're working on it? So when you get an engine indication there's the, of a fire, there are loops in the engine that there's dual loops so that you don't just get one that goes bad, maybe gets a bad signal. Both have to indicate a certain amount of heat uh, in the engine for the fire warning light to come on. That fire warning light may not go out right away, even if the fire is out. It may take a little while to cool down. So they don't know if A, they have the fire completely out or if it's just a heat issue that they need to give a little time to reside, uh, to lower. And so what they've done is, I think we're gonna hear here in a minute that they fired both bottles. Now, what are the bottles? The bottles are the fire extinguishing agent, and both engines have two bottles each. So typically, we will pull the fire handle, which shuts off fuel to the engine. And then, if you still got a fire indication, the checklist tells you to fire bottle number one. So you turn the handle to the left, you hold it there for one second, you wait for the light to come on that says the, the extinguishing agent has expelled into the engine, and then you wait 30 seconds. The uh, computer will automatically start a 30-second countdown clock for you, uh, and if after 30 seconds that engine fire light is still on or one of your flight attendants in the back says, hey, I still see flames coming out of the engine, you take that handle and you turn it all the way to the right and you extinguish the other 
fire bottle. You've got two on each side. After that, you don't have any more. That's why you want to continue back to the field for a landing. You don't have a lot of time to mess around with a fire that's not contained. One last thing on the fire, the nacelle around the engine, that's what it's called. The containment unit around the engine is not there to just look pretty or to advertise your company website on it. It's there to contain the fire and it does a really, really nice job. As you saw from the earlier video, that fire was contained inside that nacelle. They're gonna turn back to the field. Let's see how it goes. When you can, please, sir, give me the souls on board and souls fuel on board and fuel. They always ask for that. As you know from this channel. Delta 446, have you one able? Can you give me uh, souls on board and fuel at time? Okay, we have uh, 240 souls on board. And fuel is uh, six and a half hours. Delta 446, heavy. Thank you, Delta 446, heavy. Okay, why do they need that information for the fire trucks that are going to meet you? They want to know how much fuel potentially they're dealing with on the airplane. And uh, if you had to hold, how long could you hold? Delta 446, heavy fighting on 070. This vector is going to take you out of Cosmo Air Space. 070 heading Delta 446. So they're going to get them out of the way for a little bit, give them time to work through their checklist. Delta 446, heavy information. India, Albert, and LA altimeter to you. Now, this controller is really great. He's um, pacing his conversation with them, giving them time to do the checklist. He knows that they've got several things they have to work through. So remember I said you do the first five items and then you do the con, con, con. Well, you continue with the checklist. So that engine shutdown checklist may have 20, 25 items on it. Now you got to work through all the rest of those items. What other items would you need to work through? Well, you're going to be overweight when you come back for a landing. So that's an additional checklist that failure checklist is going to send you to the overweight checklist so you can do everything you need to to get an overweight landing. It's also going to send you to another checklist, which is called the uh, the precautionary landing checklist or the non-normal landing checklist, some companies call it. And that non-normal is going to get you to talk to the flight attendants and the passengers and to brief your number one flight attendant to let them know what's going on. Are we going to evacuate on the ground? Are we not going to evacuate on the ground? Then you have to do what we call two out and two in. All right, the two out are dispatch. You have to get a hold of your company. You have to get a hold of ATC, which he already has, and told them their intentions. The two in are you got to let the flight attendants know what's going on and you have to make a PA to the passengers, let them know what's going on. Those are all the extra administrative things that go with just working through this checklist, which takes you to another checklist, which takes you to another checklist. That's why all these things kind of take a little bit of time. But these guys are on it. Delta 446 heavy contact approach now 134.9. You're doing all this while they're switching frequencies and still flying the airplane, right? Remember that. So we're going to fast forward for you a little bit here. All right. Delta 446 heavy with you, 3,000. Delta 446 heavy, turn 10 degrees left and maintain out to 3,000. I'll have low momentarily. Speed is your discretion. All right, 060, 3,000, and right, we're going to maintain about 200. It's difficult to, to open up LAX to bring in an emergency aircraft. Delta 446 aircraft. heavy, Roger. What do you need from me? Do you want a short approach? Do you want to go out further? Great question. Yeah, we're a little bit heavy. We can, uh, we can go outside of Hyundai. That, that, that can't go there if that's what they're doing. Hyundai is just an intersection on the approach to runway 25 left. So they're just giving them a point and saying, yeah, we just need to get a little bit outside that. That'll probably give us enough time. So great communication back and forth between the, the air, air traffic controllers. Yep, and absolutely. The uh, just fly present heading for now and maintain 3,000. Again, I'll have lower momentarily. Okay, down to 446. Everybody's communicating their expectations to the other person, giving them a heads up of what's coming next. Delta 446 heavy, there's traffic 12 o'clock and three miles eastbound to the VFR aircraft, 2,400 indicated, turn 10 degrees left. Okay, 10 more degrees left, Delta 446 heavy. LAX is having to clear everybody else out to get these guys in. Delta 446 heavy, is this good for a base or you want to go out further? It's any time now, Delta 446. Delta 446 heavy, turn left heading 340. 340, Delta 446 heavy. All right, now they're starting their turn in. They're going to start to configure the airplane. Delta 446 Heavy, continue left turn heading 280, intercept the 25 left localizer. Company traffic north of you in Atlanta North Complex. Okay, so this guy's calling out traffic. He's going to put him on 25 left. That's the southerly most runway at LAX. Uh, typically, you would land on that runway. Uh, I've landed on that runway 100 times. Uh, sometimes they'll bring you over to the right, but that's a nice long runway. Here's what's going on in the aircraft right now. They've worked through all of their checklists. They've briefed the flight attendants. They've briefed the passengers. Now they've got to make sure that they get 
everything configured for the airplane. They have to go into their iPad and figure out their landing distance with a one engine, not two. It's going to be a little bit longer of a landing. They got to make sure they're legal for that runway. They have to do their overweight checklist. They've gone through that. Now they're getting configured. What does that mean? They're lowering the flaps. So do you put out normal flaps when you're missing an engine? No, you, you take a reduced flap setting. So they're most likely going to flat land with flaps 20 degrees instead of 25 or 30. They just don't need all the drag, but that also means that they're going to land a lot faster than they normally would. They're heavy and they've got a reduced flap setting. So instead of touching down at 140 knots, they're going to touch down at about 175. And I'm telling you, it's a big difference with how fast you're going. It also takes a lot longer to stop. They've factored all of that in. They're getting configured when they turn that base leg. Right, the 280 has set the width five left off four, four, six, heavy. Now they get turned on to final. Delta 446 Heavy, you're six miles from GG, maintain altitude 2000 until established, cleared ILS approach 251. 2000 until established, cleared ILS 25 left, Delta 446 Heavy. The training's really kicking in at this point. These guys are. Delta 446 Heavy, speed is your discretion. Connect Los Angeles Tower 127.85, 2785. Delta 446 Heavy. They didn't take any extra time. They did it right by the book. Delta 446 Heavy with the final 25 left, emergency aircraft. Delta 446 Heavy LA Tyrants 240 at Niner Desk 18. Runway 25 left, clear to land, caution with Summit Heavy 767, depart it and board. I said land and 25 left, Delta 446. Delta 446 Heavy, which air, which engine, one or two? Left engine, whatever one left engine is. Uh, it's no fire indication right now where it's shut down and uh, we're just going to stop it on the runway and let the trucks take a look at it. Okay, everybody is communicating their expectations and what's going to happen next. This is really important and good communication. So LAX is clarifying a few things. They're saying, hey, by the way, the engine indication, the fire is out. As, as far as we know, we're going to stop on the runway. Why did they stop on the runway? Because there's lots of those fire trucks that come out and they want to have enough room to get around the aircraft. And just in case they need to evacuate, they want enough space to be able to do that. Some taxiways, you don't have enough space to be able to do that. They're going to stop on the runway. That's what I'm always going to do. Let's see how this works out. Delta 446 Heavy Roger. ARP-1 LA Tower, the number one engine next to land emergency aircraft, three and a half mile final. The ARF-1, what is ARF? Uh, you've heard it on this channel before. It's Airport Rescue and Firefighting. That's the basically the fire truck that's going to come out. But ARF-1 number one has the fire chief on it, and that's the person that you want to talk to. They're going to give the airplane most likely a frequency to speak directly to the uh, fire chief so that you can tell him exactly what you want him or her to do uh, once you come to a full stop. Delta 446 equipment standing by. Everybody's been communicated with now. Here we go. Touching down on 2.5 left. Going to roll all the way out to the end. Delta 446 heavy, say in tension. I'd like to stop here on the runway and uh, have the left engine inside the clip. Right by the book. It's exactly how I'd do it. Delta 446 heavy, Okay. So they stop there on the runway. The fire chief comes out. They get given a discrete frequency just to talk directly to the fire chief. Um, the captain and he agree that the fire is out. How do they know that the fire is out or it's not going to reignite? They've got one of those. Um, it's kind of like a gun. It's a, a temperature gun that they point at the inside of the engine. Uh, many of you who have like backyard pizza ovens and you want to see what temperature it is, you, you got one of those. It's like an infrared gun. And you point it inside and it goes, ooh, 900 degrees, ready to cook the pizzas, right? They do that same thing with the engine. They go and they go, out. Oh, the temperature is lowering or it's an acceptable temperature. It looks like the fire is out. This guy now is going to communicate with the captain that there's a puddle of gas on the ground. Well, that's what was causing is he's got some sort of a fuel leak. Who knows what caused it, but it's still leaking. Fortunately, the fire extinguishing agent put all that out. The fire did not reignite. They get down on the ground, they taxi off, they get towed into the gate, and uh, presumably they got the airplane fixed in the long run. But this is absolute classic textbook how it should go. These guys at Delta, uh, hats off to them. They did an absolutely fantastic job. I've got 10,000 plus hours on the Boeing 767. Love that airplane. Miss it. Uh, love the 777 now these days, but boy, what a great job these guys did. And folks, you got to go piece by piece all the way through this entire thing and see how it's meant to be done the right way.
Now you know. I'm Captain Steve. Fly safe.